at the camera more than you look at me, I guess. So I'm just reading support that we get, and it's for families too. Hi everyone, welcome to Commissioner Wilson's Virtual Office Hours. Yay, thank you for being here. Happy Veterans Day. Happy Veterans Day, and actually mm -hmm. it's strange to say happy because I do feel like there's a lot of uh, gravitas to it. There's some really important moments of reflection that come with Veterans Day and thanking the people who are the defenders of our freedom. Um, throughout throughout the years in, in the United States of America, I feel very grateful for all those that have served our, our services Mm -hmm. Well, there, we had a beautiful ceremony this morning where the common theme was that being a veteran is something that should be celebrated every single day. And yes. it's really a feeling, every day is veterans day. a feeling exactly. of pride, you know, for those who served our country. And, and we're so grateful for that opportunity and the freedom. That's right. We wouldn't even be able to have, I think about the freedom we have to sit here and critique our government. We can openly critique this government our state government and encourage it our federal government because of our service people going really to you know great lengths in, in our, our our history of fighting for freedoms and i feel very grateful mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. so there were two celebrations um that took place here and outside in district one for diwali the festival of lights oh, diwali actually it wasn't district one but the a lot of the members um live in district one so it was really a beautiful um, celebration. Diwali is, it is a, it's a new year and it's celebrated by um, individuals all over the world. In India, they said mm -hmm. that even in different regions that there are different variations, but the common theme is that it's a festival of light and this idea of unity and of goodness over evil and of um, bringing a community together. So it really resonated with us and there's the beautiful um, fabrics and flowers and foods and community. It was wonderful celebration. Yay, beautiful. Um, also today, you had a really awesome uh, kickoff for Great Oaks Village's fundraiser for the holidays. Yeah, so one of the things that I feel like is a hidden treasure or a, really a, a point of pride for Orange County is that Orange County is one of the few charter counties in the state that under its own umbrella uh, takes care of some high-risk kids at a, at a, in a group setting um, that are sometimes transitioning or have some um, are removed from their home for whatever reason. So it's a foster setting, but it also is a school. And it also is a place of um, camaraderie and of um, growth. And I will tell you the staff, they are some dedicated, amazing people. The families that engage with Great Oaks Village are sometimes going through the worst times that they can ever imagine going through. And the thought of having that type of community support that's provided at Great Oaks Village should make everybody feel better knowing it's out there. Um, they do, they receive funds from the state and from our locality, our, our, um, our county, but they also need additional funds for things that are not really covered in what we think of as, as Christmas, and they really try to get very specific wish lists from the kids that are there at living at Great Oaks Village so that they can fulfill those that wish list. 
And I love that they tailor it. It's not just a pile of, of donated toys. They literally find out what is needed. And, you know, as a kid, sometimes those things are very specific, like a, like a certain pair of sneakers. like to donate to Great Oaks Village, please reach out. We will um, make sure that that is taken care of and goes into this fundraising time that we have. We will, the whole county can now the different departments. And I guess last year, um, the top two were uh, public works departments and um, utilities. So of course, you know, very competitive professionals in both those departments. So there was a little bit of smack talk today about who's going to raise the most money for Great Oaks College. And so, you know, we'd like as a commissioner's office to maybe throw our hat in the ring here and see if we can raise raise some money and give them a run for their uh, run for the money here and get all those wishes taken care of. Yes, awesome. Um, let's chat a little bit about some of the events that you've had take place this week. Um, Fizzling Orange uh, during Global Entrepreneur. This was such a busy week. I know I say this every week, so I'm sorry because that sounds like a so I know, but this week really was, was so crammed in that when you said that, I was like, but that was last week. No, that was this week. This is Orange is part of our, um, Orange County has really made a concerted effort to invest in entrepreneurship, some innovative business upstarts. I think there's been a misconception that Orange County is a one trick pony that will only have, you know, one big industry here and, and we know that is you know it's tourism, tourism but, but we don't, don't we have many and, and some, some of them are sort of affiliated industries but some of them aren't and this seeing these innovative ideas come forward as economic drivers is really exciting BizLink orange is actually a resource a tool that if you are an entrepreneur and you're interested in finding out where you might fit into the entrepreneurial community We've got some resources for you. So Bislink Orange is, is a um, really sponsored by Orange County, but other stakeholders, nonprofits and other um, either economic drivers or other municipalities. And it, it's available to anybody, anybody that's interested in getting into the entrepreneurial world. Um, so I would encourage you, if you are interested in really a startup entrepreneurial business and especially something in that one of those innovative fields where people are really learning a lot from each other and getting that collaborative effect please reach out we will get you connected it's it's really cool there's a QR code you go right in and it links you with um, all the resources that are available awesome um, you also went to the Metro Plan Orlando meeting yes so Metro Plan Orlando is a regional effort to try to come up with transportation and transit planning. And this is something that is obviously a very hot topic in District 1, actually all over Orange County. And even more so, you know, our office, we feel very passionately about access to good transit, transportation options, um, not creating a perpetuating environment of dependency on the automobile. And so any opportunity I get to sit at the table where those decisions are made, I'm gonna take the opportunity. Um, I asked very early on in my tenure for an appointment to Metro Plan Orlando and um, have not been able to get that appointment yet through the mayor's office, but I did. I am an alternate, which means that if another commissioner can't go, I'm able to step in and sit at that seat. And in a you know stroke of good luck, this happened to be the Metro Plan meeting where they were discussing transportation issues that the DOT is now undergoing in District 1. So we had an update from the Department of Transportation in the state on the interchanges, um, the I-4 interchanges at Daryl Carter Parkway, at Sand Lake Road, um, and the intersection there at Turkey Lake and Sand Lake, which is a huge headache for people. Um, that is a Department of Transportation intersection. So. I think, you know, understanding a little bit about the way that the county has an opportunity to interact with the Department of Transportation. We don't get to, I don't get to make decisions about that intersection, but knowing that I can access the people that do at Metro Plan kind of gives a, a better idea of what that type of meeting is good for, right? That I can sit there and say, hey, my residents 
are very concerned about pedestrian safety, you know, fill in the blank. And so one of the conversations that actually were discussions that came up was in a presentation from the Department of Transportation, um, the outfall from Big Sand Lake, which of course has been a very, very challenging issue. Residents that we love here that have um, lived a lifetime on Big Sand Lake and have seen unprecedented changes in their water levels, um, changes in their water quality, and have not been able to get clear answers. Um, my office has done nothing short of banging on every door in the county, um, most of the doors in Tallahassee. Yeah. Uh, so we, we are, and, and we're still doing that, don't get me wrong, but it was really a good thing to hear the update from the Department of Transportation planners that are working on the interchange that, it will, that does affect the outfall at Big Sand Lake and that the timeline is expedited, that they understand that there are issues and that Orange County residents are being negatively impacted. And so we will continue to gather information from them and get it directly to our friends at Big Sand Lake and that are directly impacted. If you have um, interest in this and you want some more information, you can do one of two things. We're going to keep sharing, but you can also go to the Metro Plan Orlando website and the, or actually, let me say this. If you go to Metro Plan Orlando on YouTube, you can watch the whole meeting and you can see the actual presentation that the Department of Transportation makes to the Metro Plan Board about the interchanges in District 1, I-4, um, interchange at Daryl Carter Parkway, Sand Lake Road. And so getting that, um, hearing directly from the horse's mouth is, I think, very helpful. You'll hear me ask very specifically about their need to engage my residents to get into District 1 and have a meeting with residents. Um, and they said that they had previously done some outreach. I reiterated the need for them to get that communication um, improved and, and to really try to make a concerted effort to improve communication about specifically Big Sand Lake. Awesome. Um, let's chat a little bit about redistricting. Redistricting is ongoing. This is where our census comes out and tells us how many people we have in Orange County. I think everybody knows Orange County has grown in population and it is this amazing diverse place. I love my home, but it has really grown in patterns in different areas. And District 1 is of course an area of great growth and has surpassed even what I believe was their projected growth. And redistricting is the effort to make sure that the different commission districts are balanced, that are equal. There needs to be equal representation and each person in a voting area should be equally represented. And so this effort really takes that census data, turns it over to a advisory board of appointees, really amazing dedicated volunteer residents that have stepped forward and given up so much of their time to dig in and come up with proposal maps. I did post earlier today, or maybe it was last night, some of the maps that have been submitted. That was only a sampling. There have been multiple maps in addition to those. And I would really encourage you to take a look. Um, I think the interesting thing really is gonna be to see what happens to the municipalities in District 1. Many of the maps cut Winter Garden out, even though I consider myself a you know, really big part of the Winter Garden community and have worked really closely with Winter Garden and, and feel that that is, that's home, that that's my district. So it's going to be interesting. Some of them cut out Oakland, but not Winter Garden. Some of them cut out Ocoee and Winter Garden and um, leave in Oakland. So there's really, there's many, many, many options that are sort of in play right now. The public is encouraged to actually work on a map. If you want to submit a map, what we do is we get you in touch with one of the board members that's an appointment from District 1, and they can present that map to the board. Um, so please, if you want to kind of look at the dashboard, you can see the demographics. One of the things the Constitution tells us, and we abide by it here and across the country, hopefully, is that we can't dilute a vote of a community that has historical cultural significance. That when we look at the census, we also have to look at a, a racial um, um, changes in the demographic and make sure that we're not diluting the vote of a minority community. So we want to make sure that all those things are considered with every single one of the maps. And I think the interesting part of learning about our communities is finding out 
that diluting a community with redistricting isn't the only issue. That when it comes to local government, there are communities that feel very strongly that having more than one commissioner gives them an advantage. Mm -hmm. Because then there's a checks and balances about some of the things that happen in local government, like your stoplight or your, you know, your stop signs or your a, a pothole that if you're not getting an answer here, maybe I can go there. Well, if that's not someone that shares that area, then I can't get anyone else. And so it was an interesting thing to learn that as opposed to a state lawmaker or a federal lawmaker, that the considerations on a local level are a little more complex based on what falls into local government. I really appreciate you attending local meetings and being there and showing representation and thank you to all the constituents that do go oh out and participate. Yes. Like it's really needed during this time. Input is so valuable. I I am so impressed with the amount of engagement and the thought that residents have put into this. I, I was just happened to be sitting next to a woman at the last one that drove to Wakaiva High School, um, you know, on a nighttime, a Monday night. Um, from Maitland because she was concerned about the Maitland Newton Bill split. And she said, I'm, I'm working on a map, I've never done this before. The idea of that one person, one vote, it's thrown around a lot as a you know type of kind of something we take for granted, but it it really makes a difference when you look at the way that these these communities could be affected and their voice could be affected by the outcome. And so, you know, for me, this is going to be a difficult process no matter what, because I'm going to lose portions of District 1 no matter what. And these are people that, that showed up and that voted for me and that are engaged. And sometimes it's areas where I know I've got appointees, you know, on boards that, that stepped up for District 1 or that, you know, that we know because we've grown up together in this area. And so, you know, it's just gonna be a difficult process. Thank you for being engaged with it. If you have questions about it, if you would like to hear my thoughts about it, please reach out. I would be more than glad to, to kind of further discuss it. Yes, so the next meeting is going to be November 15th at 6.30 p.m. Um, if you want to kind of talk, run through some of the maps and look at them together, we can do that. Just email district1 at ocfl.net or if you have any questions at all um, about redistricting, this is going to be at the Goldenrod Recreation Center on November 15th. Yeah, and I, you know, I want to say something. When you look at the maps, there are some of the lines look really weird. It's because when you go to use the software, you can't just draw a line. Um, the way that the census blocking is done it sometimes will kind of adjust, right? And it, it either means that there's something within that of concern, or maybe it's a there's just commercial entities, so there's not necessarily a population, so it does like a, it looks collapsed. Um, but y the closer you zoom in, the more sense it makes as far as where some of those weird lines are. I think everybody that's on that committee, the commission, the advisory committee, they're really being thoughtful. And I know that they come from a, a variety of political backgrounds and that we're not all necessarily all in agreement and policy mm -hmm. issues. But what I am really grateful for is that they've all really worked hard to stay focused on the goal and the mission of having that one person, one vote and being fair to each district. Very well said. All right, so let's chat a little bit about COVID. We got some really great news about vaccinations for uh, children under the age of 12. Oh, I think we are close to a million vaccinated American kids now. Yay. And it, it does really feel, I have friends all over the country that are going out to dinner with their children for the first time in, how long's it been? I mean, it's a relief. It's what a surreal thing that they are um, finally feeling that weight off their shoulders. And I, we're not totally out of the woods, but our numbers look really good. We have been under what under three percent rolling positivity mm -hmm. now for long enough mm -hmm. that I, the mayor's no longer doing. We ha we're not under a state of emergency. We no longer are having our emergency press conferences. We're not getting the sit reports from our emergency operations center. And as much as I love the people that work in our emergency operations center, we don't want to be under a state of emergency and we really want everyone to be healthy mm -hmm. and well. That being said, please be patient and kind with people. There's still so much anxiety. There's been so much loss. Everyone I know has lost someone they know. Mm -hmm. 
And so we are coming out of what I feel like is that time of um, the, the Delta variant, really the, the fear and the rampant spread of that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that we can't be really cognizant of other people's sensitivities and what they've gone through. And that's, yeah. you know, that's my plea right now. And even if that's a small business that still has a, a rule that they want to impose, that's their business. They're allowed to do that. And I ask that you be supportive and encouraging of anybody that does something that makes their anxiety go down. Yep. Yep. You know, something that was said today during the, um, the flag raising ceremony was that you kind of share a bond when you go through an extreme circumstance. And I think we all should really be focusing on this yes. bond that we have in, in our experience and struggling with yes. COVID, you know, across the entire world. You know, I've lost someone very close to me from COVID and there's a lot of trauma there that we can't just forget. We can't just right. move on quickly. We have to really take the time to m empathize with each other right now. Exactly. So. I think if we focus on the division, the divisive parts of it, we're not going to heal. No. I think if we hold on to each other and lift each other up and look for the common ground, we can heal. And yeah. It's going to take some time and some patience, but you know, I think we have been through listening mm -hmm. today to some of the historical perspectives yeah. of what we've been through reminds us that we've been through some really difficult times mm -hmm. and always found a way to be a strong country together. Just real quick, there are emergency rental assistance programs and funding still available. Uh, we did have more people reach out to our office this week asking for support. Please email district1 at ocfl.net or you, know, you can give us a call, which we'll drop that in the comments. Please just let us know. We want to help. We want to help you before things get to a point where you get evicted. So Exactly. And it's a voluntary program, but we, we still have, you know, we would love to try to help you navigate those waters. You know, we had this week, we actually were able to thank the people at Orange County Bar Association's uh, legal services for the work they've done on, during this time because, you know, navigating that part of it, the legal part of it, can be also extremely stressful and anxiety provoking. But they're out there. We have some really amazing attorneys working pro bono, off, you know, after hours, before hours, to try to help people navigate that. So if you need some assistance with that, please reach out. Awesome. So let's talk about the Board of County Commission meeting. You have back-to-back -back Board of County Commission meetings because of the holidays, so uh, we're going to be giving a lot of updates about it. So it's going to feel really good to get to, I'm going to be really thankful at Thanksgiving <laughs> for all the blessings I have, including, um, getting to that point in the year knowing how busy it has been and i will tell you yeah. that this last one was a um it you know it wasn't the longest one we've been there what 12 14 16 hours before this so wasn't mm -hmm, the longest mm -hmm. one but it was there was some stressful or tense moments there were some really interesting things that we discussed and i really um, i want to thank the residents that we heard from um you know I, I actually was able to have a community meeting with a group of residents out in horizon west before coming to this um Board of County Commission meeting, and so seeing them twice about something that they feel that they care really a lot about makes me feel like my job is, you know, it makes my job more meaningful and understanding that we're on the same page as far as really being committed to our community. So thank you for being there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's go through some of the, the consent agenda items. Our friends from A Thousand Friends of Florida um, sent us some information on um, a new property rights element conversation, which I'm excited to chat about. Well, it's, it's interesting. So the Florida legislature added a requirement for counties to include in their comprehensive plan. So we have you know, land use comprehensive planning. Um, and the property rights element was sort of a restatement of property rights. I, I don't really think the legislation was super meaningful because we really have a lot of pretty strong property rights in this country and in the state of Florida. But Thousand Friends of Florida took the opportunity to use that to send out some model language that is, you know, allows compliance, but also has some really great suggestions for if we are continuing to strengthen property rights or the rights of, you know, developers, that we should also, you know, figure out how to incorporate or include some more involvement, transparency, and interaction with residents, with the public, because mm -hmm. ultimately there are oftentimes an adversarial positions, and that is unfortunate because really we should, you know, the developers and the residents should be able to find a way 
to do the right thing going forward. And, and you know, we, we find time after time that that doesn't seem to be the case, that there are voices in a community that live there who are raising their children there who are not getting heard um, at the expense of, you know, some profit margin. And I just want to make sure that I'm being clear. That's not every developer. We've had some really great engagements and some really committed people in this area that when they go to do something as far as a comprehensive plan um, change or, or some kind of an application, really do a great job working with our office. Um, but there is a tension there. And so Thousand Friends of Florida's idea was to get model language out that would increase the transparency and involvement and even really give a little bit of control back to the district commissioner where there are district commissioners. So, for instance, one of the things they said that was that if there was a comprehensive plan change or update um, uh, in it went to the board, that potentially there should be or could be a super majority vote to approve it. And our commission rightfully talked about whether or not that would be a burden and if that would be a good idea. And I made a very, you know, I, what I thought was a comment that was kind of a middle ground saying, you know, I don't know if we need to go to a supermajority vote yeah. for a comprehensive plan um, change, but to have some deference, some deference shown to the district commissioner if that's where, you know, if the land use, if it's a land use issue, mm -hmm. because that commissioner is the one that's met with the people. Yeah. That's the, the office that's worked hand in hand with that community. And so without having to push for a supermajority, is there a way to show some deference? And if you tuned in, you'll know that within, you know, two hours of this conversation, I was overruled on a land use case in District 1. So, it, you know, there, there's going to be ongoing conversations for how to make sure that that representation is fair to the residents. You, you, you know, residents don't get to vote for commissioners at large. They vote for their district commissioner. So does it make sense that then a land use issue can be decided by everyone else but their commissioner? Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. I, and that's not normal. That's not something that has historically happened. Usually the commissioner of that district is usually looked to for the first vote as kind of the indicator vote for how the other commissioners are going to you know, back you. But unfortunately, I think there's just this interest to keep things going the way that they've been going in terms of future developments and, and stuff. And I don't, you know? I don't know, I can't get in the heads of other people on my board and I think it's not, you know, I, I think if I got, went down that path that I could really get distracted. And so what I really have tried so hard to do is to articulate during that time what I'm hearing from my boss, which is you all, the residents. Which many residents came. They were there. Many residents they were there. came and, and spoke up, exactly. which means that that's even more of a reason for other commissioners to back. No, can you all hear the rain? This is like, uh, it is. Well, the mic down. is really good on it. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. That we, I, there are times in, in this office that the rain is um, when it, it lands on the, on the glass outside, it has a really neat sound. but. Yeah, this was a really, to me, a, a strange set of circumstances because the land use case that we're talking about um, actually started in 2013 when a developer came in and applied to put in a housing development. And as part of that application, they were asking to affect some conservation land. There was wetland impacts that were going to happen. And so as part of the wetland impact mitigation, they were required to conserve some of the area of the land around the development. And so they put on-site on -site conservation easements into, or on-site mitigation into their plan and basically put a conservation easement in place. And you know, there, were more, there was more than one party involved. So the water management district was involved, the county was involved, and the developer was involved. In, it was all platted and put sort of into the system. Um, and here we are, you know, several years later. Um, and I think, you know, knowing that property values in that area are extraordinary right now. And the only thing that can get you more for a house in District 1 than mm -hmm. just having a beautiful house is having a beautiful house with a dock. So the developer put a a dock over this conservation easement that was donated mm -hmm. as part of their mitigation for affecting a wetland and was cited by EPD. 
EPD cited them. It was, you know, someone in EPD was alerted to this doc. It, there was a permit that was erroneously given based on an incorrect survey over the conservation easement. So it seems like, you know, a lot of mistakes were made. Sloppy, negligent, or malicious, I don't know. Because there's a lot of care. people that all have had their hands on the case. A lot of people, and I think at the end of the day, what I felt was a really difficult thing to get past was that the residents got the short end of the stick. And I mean all the residents, right? The ones that bought a home that were told you can build a dock, got lied to. The ones that were told that's always going to be in conservation because I know that you all are scared your water quality is going down. They were lied to. The county who was told, hey, we're not going to have to worry about mitigating somewhere else because we're going to put this in conservation easement and that's going to satisfy our need to get this permit done, got lied to. The only party that came out ahead in all of this was the developer. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it was the worst example of that um, bad actor in a way that was hard to identify without you know really just calling them out on the dais and it's a public hearing which means that if i was to do that it would be like a judge leaning over and yelling guilty mm -hmm. <laughs> at a defendant it's improper so all i could do was point back to the documents that we had in front of us and the documents that we had in front of us included the original application for the conservation easement, the recording of the conservation easement, the plotting that had the conservation easement. And, you know, I, I at the end of the day, really, am, I was horrified that people were lied to um, mm -hmm. by the developer about the docks. But I think that if, we, if we've used on-site mitigation to make up for wetland impact, that we have to stay true to that. Because where does that, that you know, if we start chipping away at that, then where does it stop? And so I did make a motion to deny. And you know, based on nothing more than the fact that this was put into conservation easement as a mitigation for the development. And the, um, I got a second and then it did not pass. Um, mm -hmm. The District Two Commissioner made a motion for approval and it passed and that was the end of that. So you know, I will continue to hear you as residents and to try to make sure that I'm representing you every chance I get mm -hmm. accurately. I apologize for not being as effective as I would like to be and maybe you know we'll figure out ways going forward if you're watching this and there is something of concern and you have ideas for, for how we can garner a consensus because I think that when when you know it's a bunch of residents and a district commissioner and we are trying to sort of stand up to what we feel like may be some manipulation on a developer's part, that that should be enough. That that should be enough. That should have been enough. And so, you know, I'm regrouping. And it just, it's particularly frustrating because there are some type of crazy developments on wetlands every single two weeks. And sometimes in the same time when we do a, wa a water appreciation month, like in April, we had a bunch of wetlands that were getting deforested. There were times when there was literally a flooding concern and there was a takings case right next to two wetlands that were being uh, developed on. And then a retention pond that was going to be installed on a wetland, the same, the same DCC. Yeah. So it's like and you, yeah. you are like, okay, I'm going to make this statement so that it can be heard this time. And I'm going to do it this time. And it's how many times do you have to make such a clear on the nose statement? at a time when you have public input of people yeah. who are also just as concerned and then you get voted against in your own district. It's just, it's a clear message that is water quality really on other commissioners' agenda as much as it I should agree. be? I agree, and I think if I, if I was tuning into this or if I was watching that and I lived in another commission district that I would ask, I would ask why, why is it that, what was it about the developer's plan, or what was it about, you know, this conservation area that wasn't important enough for you to listen or hear those residents? And I, you know, and I think it happened, you know, so the, the other case on Tuesday that was challenging for me because I was not here when the rezoning took place. And I am here for the PSP, which is the subdivision plan, the preliminary subdivision plan. And so it's my only opportunity to try to dig in and find out what we can do for quality of life issues. 
So the rezoning took place, which means the developer in this case feels, you know, like, okay, green light, let's go. Um, and it was 400 and some odd single family dwellings in, you know, I think it was something like not even 150 acres. Mm -hmm. There was surface waters, definitely wetland. Um, schools in, that were zoned, that this subdivision will be zoned for, were over capacity, and all the roadways were fa failing. <laughs> and it's like, now vote on it. So here we go again. Yeah. Right, so here we go yeah. again. I'm going to say it again. Failing roadways, over capacity schools, wetland impacts, and surface water impacts. And I dared to question it. You mm -hmm. would have thought, you would have thought that I was questioning the sun coming up in the morning when I said, can somebody explain to me why this was, you know, why this has been, the staff, you know, approved it, the, there was never any questions about it, why, and how do I make sure I can explain to my residents what the county's recommendation was based on? And this was the answer I got, you ready? That was all already done. We already did that. Now, if I'd asked the questions when we were rezoning, you know what they would say? We'll get to that when we get the PSP. Yeah. So, you know, the, the answer ultimately is, hey, Wilson, shut up. Just shut up. Shut up. We this is how it's you. been done. The staff is going to recommend it. and They, they don't want to set a precedence for this pushback. They don't want it. To, they kind of want you to be defeated, I feel, because if you're defeated, then you'll just continue to let these things go and you won't question anything else in the future. And it's like, that's not how it works. And if it was an unreasonable question, I get it. Or just answer me, right? Like if there was a, if there was an unreasonable question about an elementary school that has 400 more kids than it was designed to have, and now we're adding four, that's 800 mm -hmm. little people that we've made a promise to. You go into a sales office to buy a home. And you know what they don't have is a warning sign that says, your home's going to be gorgeous, but your kid's going to have to sit on the floor when they get to school. On the bus. We, we, will, we will hold on to a certificate of occupancy until you have your landscaping put in. But it doesn't really matter if every road around you is failing. And I, this is, to me, it's insanity. And I can't tell you how strange it is that when I asked the questions, everyone in the room looked at me like I was not just asking ridiculous questions, but I was like evil for asking them, you know? And at the end of the discussion, I said, you're, you're saying I don't really have any choices, right? Yeah. No, because this was already rezoned. This was rezoned before you even got in that seat. I mean, people try to make an argument sometimes about this, you know, you pushing back, or not maybe even you particularly, but pushing back on those types of things is, means that you're killing jobs or you're against uh, development. No. And it's like, you're also getting the calls of constituents who are pissed that their roads, people are dying on their roads, oh my the gosh. speed limit and is crazy. safety is paramount. They have to travel 45 minutes minimum just to right. get to work. And you know, they talk about, oh, this is consistent with our comprehensive plan. You have to vote yes on it. But you know what our comprehensive plan actually says? That any type of, of high density, this is actually in the comprehensive plan, development needs to be within seven miles of an economic driver. This one wasn't. You know what else it says? It says that we need to prove on the, like, up front that there weren't going to be wetland mitigations. I didn't get that. So there are things, like, we pick that, that the future land use component of the comprehensive plan, mm -hmm. and we, that is all the chips. That is where we're playing right there, and the rest of the comprehensive plan can just go away. Yeah. And it's not really regarded, and I, I just, my, you know, my thing about it is I don't, I, I'm not anti-growth. I'm not anti-density. But I don't think that we're doing anybody any favors by, by allowing large, sprawling suburban density far away from economic drivers, not near services, far away from fire departments. And, you know, we, our emergency services personnel are already maxed out. Our sheriff's department, mm -hmm. our fire department, they shouldn't. When we're goofing up the design of a street, we shouldn't dump that burden on the sheriff's department. Yeah, I mean, driving out, I love the residents of District 1. I love meeting you all, but I will say driving out there and seeing the sea of houses with no shade cover, you know, the, the roads, barely any bikeability or walkability. I see people running across Avalon with cars speeding with no crosswalks, and I just... I'm just, I'm worried about yeah. the quality of life with this sea of houses 
really, really close to each other to the point where we get complaints of voice volume being too loud of their neighbors <laughs> because you can literally hear your neighbor talking at night and it just some I feel like we we did a disservice to those people out there by approving these tiki tacky houses as a sea of you know on on Lake County uh, line so far out there it's literally on a dirt road but you know I just stay tuned we're gonna keep pushing I I'm nothing if not stubbornly <laughs> and you know what it it if you weren't here it would have just been a yes yeah. vote and, and I no one would have pushed back and no and then all the constituents wouldn't have felt hurt at all no and I and I want to give I do want to give a shout out to um, so I got a call actually from a resident who does some work out in Hamlin that one of the builders out there was bringing in mature oaks um, so that they would be providing shade by like year three Mm -hmm. And so they were going above and beyond what the code required them to do. Mm -hmm. And I, what I'm going to really, really make a concerted effort to do is every time I see someone in the building and developing community doing something to improve the quality of life like that, that's above and beyond, because I don't think we've done a good job of articulating the things that we need in our code, and we're not enforcing the things in our comprehensive plan that preserve mm -hmm. our quality of life. So I want to thank the resident who reached out to let me know about that. If you see something like that, if you know something like that, please reach out to me because I do want to hold up the people in that field, in that industry, as examples of how it can be done the right way. Very well said. All right, let's just connect on a couple uh, things that came up. The Citizen Safety Task Force gave an update this last BCC. Yes, so the Citizen Safety Task Force was formed after some tragic shootings in Orange County mm -hmm. involving some youth. I think the youngest one was under five. It was really a very sad time. There continues to be you know, gun violence across the country. Um, there's been no appetite for any real gun safety measures on a larger legislative front. So the county government really wanted to find out what they could do in partnership with our faith-based community, our nonprofit community, and so mm -hmm. there was a very large coalition that met and had, there was different subcommittees. Uh, there was a um, prevention subcommittee, a prosecution subcommittee. Uh, there was, I can't think of the other subcommittees right now because my brain just got foggy, but we got updates and basically we're gonna be able to really understand now where we want to invest. And so, you know, obviously for District 1, my big concern that I raised was making sure that access is equal across the county mm -hmm. because you know we know that there are areas in district one that may not be close to a community center or a substation or um, one of the places that we're able to do we're investing in some more after school programs we're investing in more mental health um, intervention and so my question was how are we getting that to some of these areas that aren't necessarily in a incorporated municipal area or are you know a little bit further away from an urban center and I was so excited to hear we're coming to them there's going to be opportunities to utilize um, to partner with some you know school district with library with trying to figure out how to set up some of these services in non-traditional places so that we can get out there we can't put a community center at the end of each street mm -hmm. and we don't have transit figured out yet yeah. So we've got to take those services where they're needed. And, you know, obviously Tildenville was on the top of my mind, knowing that the struggles that the families there have gone through and have been really left out of some of these conversations because, because they are not in, you know, an urban, a more urban setting. So mm -hmm. I was really, really encouraged by hearing some of the plans. That's awesome. That's awesome. There was also a really quick uh, update on the Shingle Creek bike trail as well. Um, Shingle Creek, we didn't really, it was on the just consent. a little bit of funding was just allocated I was say it was on the toward, consent agenda, so probably yes. if you listened in, it wasn't talked about, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's a trail system that's going to be a comprehensive trail system, which I think for those of us who like to get out there and bike and, and, and run and don't want to be on the side of a road because we haven't done a great job of protecting them on the side of the road, hearing about the trail system and the links and the connectivity is so exciting. And I know we've hit some hiccups in some places, but we're moving forward and Funding is really coming in from many, many different places. Another part of the agenda, the consent agenda, that I actually had an opportunity to sort of put a, a shout out, a uh, thank you to the West Orange Chamber and to the 
um, friends of Lake Apopka um, mm -hmm. and all of our municipal partners out in West Orange County was the West Orange Trail Task Force, which we mm -hmm. signed on as. And so, you know, having that overlap of municipal, county, mm -hmm. and nonprofit partners really gives us the best opportunity to not just preserve mm -hmm. the historic character and the asset that is the West Orange Trail, but also to restore some of the things that there's been some loss or concern about. Yeah. Um, the next one will be December 8th, so I'm super excited to share updates about that. Um, now, in closing, just some quick um, events coming up. So in just three and a half weeks, a little more, it'll be your one year here. Oh my gosh. So we're going to be doing- I've only aged like 30 years. <laughs> We're going to be doing like a little annual report. Maybe we should yes. have like a special virtual office oh, hour where you just recap that. the year or something like that. I think that I would, would be nice. I would love that. I would love mm -hmm. that. And I think, you know, let me know. What are your suggestions? Where are we? I think I, I try to be really clear about where I stand, but if there's something I'm not, getting to or you feel like I talked about before I got here mm -hmm. um, that hasn't come back let's let's talk about it I mean I'm so grateful that you took me on this wild ride I mean sitting <laughs> here it so. feels like I'm still the exact same person just as scared just as nervous because I really want to do a good job and I really want to work for these constituents that I've had the pleasure of meeting so far and, yeah. and not let you down but man it's just like juggling <laughs> juggling 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 but it's fun it's a lot it's a lot but we are we are so grateful to the residents. I'm so grateful for you, mm -hmm. for Hannah, for the people that have really been, I think, on those good and bad days, just solid. And I mm -hmm. think that, mm -hmm. you know, even with the challenges we have, finding some optimism, finding that hope, looking for, you know, a way to get through, we'll keep working, we'll get it done. I mean, there have been some big accomplishments and we'll recap those. Yep. We still have a lot, a lot of work to do. So no victory lap yet, but mm -hmm. um, but it's enough to kind of fuel us to keep going. Yes, yes. November 30th, just uh, one of those things that I hope to put on the annual report right in time is that we are going to be talking about the tree ordinance and the um, fertilizer ordinance yes. in the same Board of County Commission meeting. So Big if you deal. can tune in or come to any of them, come to that one. Come to that one if you can't come. You know, you can drop a note and just say, I, you know, to all of the commissioners, the mayor, just thank you for working on this. This is important to the residents of Orange County. I feel like I'm a broken record, but I hear from you, so I know it's important to you. And um, Saturday? Saturday is Matthew's Hope Supply Drive, um, November 13th at 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. There's also gonna be a fundraiser on Facebook, which will drop the link in the comments. Um, we are raising money between now and the end of the um, month. For Matthew's Hope, they are seeing uh, record numbers of people living in camps and in their cars right now, and they are on the front lines of those vulnerable uh, parts right. of our community giving support. And they don't take government funding. You know, so there's a, I, you know, I think when you see something coming out of a commission office and you think, well, why aren't they just giving them a block grant or why aren't they? Well, because they, they've done this with community support. They've done this with generous donations mm -hmm. um, and sponsorships from both residents and from commercial entities in the area and I think you know they it gives them the opportunity to really tailor their services and the problem is the need is growing and growing and growing and so we still need to make sure that um, if there's a, a way for you to help whether it is you know the supplies themselves or you know a financial donation or volunteerism all those things are helpful what I love that they do at Matthew's Hope is they give you very specific needs. So I, I, I think sometimes if you talk to people who have been burnt, um, engaging with a, a nonprofit or a charity, mm -hmm. they'll say, well, I found out that they took my money and they spent it on you know, administrative costs or whatever. Well, their list of needs is so, you know, mm -hmm. it makes so much sense. It is so basically what you need to survive, right? Like if you are out there and you're unsheltered, what do you need? You need a sleeping bag. You really need some bug spray. Mm -hmm. You need fresh, mm -hmm. clean socks. You need soap and toothpaste. These are things that we all, within you know the realm of human dignity, shouldn't even have to ask for. But we do, because that's where we are. I hope and pray for a day that we don't have to ask for them. Until we get there, I believe our community can gather around and get those needs taken care of. So please, please, please um, take a look at the list of things that are, are being asked for. Nothing is too small. Absolutely. 
Um, the mayor and the, our communications team is going to be doing a toy drive, which will um, pretty much be getting started now. Between now and December 6th is the official cutoff time. Um, you can check that out at ocfl.net slash toy drive, where you can either donate directly or drop off uh, brand new toys that are unwrapped from um, zero to 18 years old. Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out a challenge to the residents of, of District 1, and we'll round back on this, but I think this time of year, people are reminded of, of the needs that are out there all year, because yeah. at Thanksgiving, I think we all associate it with having a big meal and being surrounded by people we love and, and being thankful for our blessings. I think what we need to do is have a, a half Thanksgiving because, you know, in the next couple months, there will be a lot of interest paid and a lot of, um, I think, time spent thinking about some of these needs. But then things will quiet down in January and February and then Sometimes that's really when it gets scary out there. Mm -hmm. And in Florida, that's our, our coldest times are sometimes the end of January, beginning of February. And the Thanksgiving, you know, canned drives are dried up. And so, you know, put that in the back of your mind that I think we're going to try to do maybe a half year mm -hmm. Thanksgiving where we do something again to remind ourselves of our blessings and remind ourselves of our, what we're grateful for and then share that out. And we don't need to wait on you know, something written on our calendar, a Thanksgiving on our calendar to express that. Very well said. Do you have any closing remarks for everyone watching today? Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you. And I'm I blessed every day. I'm grateful every day to get up and to come and serve. Yes. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you next time.